and thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm a professor of psychology, well, perception and action psychology at the Queen's University of Belfast. And essentially what I'm interested in is how do our brains pick up the sensory information all around us and use that information to control our actions or make decisions about action. I'm also the founder of a company called Incisive that's really trying to harness the power of this technology to do something different in this area. So my talk today is really just around sport, but this is also applicable to any sort of movements that we make in everyday life. I've decided, the talk, decided to divide the talk into three bits. What is decision making in sport? look at some of the current sports technologies we have and go on to really discuss what can VR really help us with? How can it add some value or give us that advantage in that space? So if we look at decision making, there are many different theories out there, but one of the most classic theories was developed in the 1970s from having studied grand chess masters play chess and look at how they made decisions there. What they noticed is they use game knowledge, they also memorize different things and make predictions based on, based on memory. And they also are very good at recognizing specific patterns of play. But in practice, this is really difficult to explain what happens in sport. It can't explain novelty, for example. In sport, there are never two situations the same. It doesn't explain the timing of our actions. So if you think about chess, nothing's moving. You can take your time and make that decision. In sport, if you don't move at the right moment in time, you're gonna miss that opportunity for action. And also in sport, we've got team dynamics, particularly of course in team sports, having to read other players' movements and anticipate what's going to happen. If we look at this example of Federer, you see that he makes this spectacular shot through his legs. And also here in the ice hockey match, you can see that this goal is scored in the most amazing way. What these players are able to show is that ability to make these decisions. Wayne Gretzky, when asked what makes a player great, said, a good hockey player plays where the puck is, but a great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. What does that mean? That means they've got the ability to anticipate, to read ahead of time, to really know what's going to happen in what I call the current future. In other words, players have this ability to make the right decision at the right time, but also execute it in the right way. This is something that I'm starting to call action intelligence. For me, this is like an emotional intelligence. It tells us what the brain's ability is about. But if we look at artificial systems, they're not very action intelligent. So this is from the Robot World Cup. And you can see the act of trying to play football for robots is really quite challenging. But yet, when we look at two and three-year-old children, they're pretty damn good at running around and able to make contact with the ball. So from a psychologist's perspective, how is this intelligence formed and what does it really mean? Well, these decisions about action, it has to start with the information we're picking up from our surrounding environment. It's our senses that put us in touch with the environment. That ability to detect the trajectory of the ball, anticipate where it's going to go. But also, like we saw with Federer, that action capability, and by that may, I mean the level of skill. So Federer can play a ball between his legs. I can't, so that's not an action choice for me. So the decisions by action are going to be formed by that complex interaction between what you perceive and how your body can act on it. So if we look at sports performance technology and what exists today, you have to ask yourself the question, what does it really me measure? Where is the decision making in it? How are we able to quantify this? So many sports teams use things like GPS. We maybe ourselves have a watch when we go running that tells us how far you run, how fast you run, what your heart rate is. But again, particularly for things like soccer, it doesn't tell you anything about the decisions the players made, doesn't tell you if they had a good game. They could have run 10 kilometers, but had a most terrible game. If we look at decision making, there are some technologies who claim they do measure decision making, this fit light system. But I ask, what's the resemblance between this and what you have to do on the pitch? 
This is stimulus response, the most basic functions we have of the human brain. This is not what we do in sport. Sport is about timing your action. It's about knowing when you should move based on what's unfolding in front of you. So perceptual information guides these decisions about action. What we really need to understand is how does the light get into the muscles? And for me, this is where something like virtual reality can help. Why? Because information is in the movement. Back to JJ Gibson, a psychologist in 1966, brought up this point about perception and movement. He says we perceive to move, so as I walk across the stage, I have to look, pick up information so as not to trip. But as I move, my perception changes as well, so it tells me how far I'm getting close to the lectern. So that information is in the interaction with the environment, something he noticed when he was trying to train World War II pilots to land the planes better. So in the recent couple of years, there's been a lot of hype around VR and sport, notably from companies like Striver. So what do they really do and how does this technology help? So the type of technology they're using is 360 degree video really. So it's a good tool for visualization. It's able to recreate visually what's happening. So here's an example of going down the bobsleigh run and of optically you're able to get that sensation of moving. But when you consider it, your movements are not doing anything to change the perceptual information that you have. So some of the work they did with the US ski team, they had the players, or sorry, the skiers with the helmet on their head, they were on these planks of wood. But the movement of the planks of wood does nothing to change the information inside the headset. So it only recreates the perceptual information and the action of the player, even if, or sorry, the skier, even if they move side to side, does nothing to change the perceptual flow field or impact on what's happening. In other words, from a psychologist's point of view, they've decoupled perception and action, which could actually be very dangerous. So what is being trained in those situations? Is anything being trained? So for me, if we really want to understand and improve decision making, it's important that VR must be like life. It means that the participants or the users, if they're inside a virtual environment, need to respond as they would in real life. In other words, you need to preserve what I call behavioral realism. So this is why I got very excited by the HTC Vive technology. Because for me, you've got this perceptual piece, obviously the information you're picking up through your eyes and your ears if you've got sound, but you've also got the action bit. So your actions change the perception. Yes, absolutely, if you put a headset on and you can turn around and you look around, you're active in the perceptual process. But with this, your movements are able to change what's actually happening in that. And you've got a broader space within which to move around. So what we're really trying to do at, in Incisive, my startup company, is probe the brain in a new way. So if you think about it, if you can control the perceptual input and measure the action output, by combining those two through your analytics, it can give you new performance insight into the brain. So each person can have exactly the same input and the variability in the output tells you something about that particular scenario. So what we've really been doing at the minute is building on the research I've been doing over the last 20 years in soccer, cricket, and also rugby, and trying to look at how these different scenarios and how somebody's ability to respond in those scenarios is influenced by what they see. So these analytics that we're able to pull out gives us that new insight. So for me, where's the opportunity for VR and sport? Well, firstly, the fact you can give every person exactly the same test, just like in school, an exam, everybody's got the same paper. What you're able to do is quantify the player's decision-making ability through the analytics. And what our research has shown, and this is very interesting, is giving somebody the same test, you will find that their action responses can be very different. So one particular player in the rugby scenario had a tendency to pass left. So we controlled the input, so it should have been 
33 and a third percent left, 33 and a third percent straight ahead, and 33 and a third percent right. But what he was doing was passing them mostly left instead of right. Now in rugby, passing left is easier when you're right-handed, and passing right is harder when you're right-handed. And because he had been injured, he had stopped or lost a bit of the skill to be able to pass in the other way. So that ability to measure the performance gave us that new insight. So the second bit that I feel there's huge advantage is to train smarter. We can augment training. This should never replace training on the pitch. Absolutely, you should keep it there. But this can add value. It can allow you to do things that you can't do in real life. So it gives you additional acting in the moment training. And by that, I mean you actually have to make a response. So for example, some of the other companies doing stuff in VR and sport, you watch something happening and then you say what it is. You don't act. Actions are manifestations of a decision. If you don't act, the decision remains locked in your head and you actually didn't do anything. You can also use it to allow players to attend to the relevant information. And by that, I mean you can use the power of the technology to highlight at key moments in time where they should be looking, some sort of dynamic cueing. And finally, what you can do is use this technology to bring players back from injury, get into the zone, so they can experience those types of flow and not run the risk of injuring themselves by having to run fast. And the very last thing is this minimizing risk of injury to others. This is particularly for sports such as baseball, cricket, where you have to, to give your batters practice, you need the bowlers or the pitchers delivering very fast balls. That runs the risk of injuring those players. Same with your four on four in rugby, trying to create gaps, you need eight players. But if you do it in VR, you can actually do it with just the person who wants to get that experience. So for me, there's lots of opportunity to use this, but it's very important that we ask ourselves the question, what value is this adding, and what does it really tell us about performance? Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. Yeah, well. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I have a, a mic, so if anybody has any questions, I got one back there. Um, and if you happen to get the mic, please introduce yourself. Um, and anyone else? Raise your hand, I'll walk up to you. Great talk. My name is Prashant Mahajan. I'm an emergency room physician. Yes. And I'm just wondering if there is some analogy that you can draw from decision making, because in the ER, you make split decisions. So I'm just wondering if there's any way you can you know, expand on that. Um, it's interesting because in my university, um, one of my medical colleagues who's trying to set up a simulation center came to speak to me about the power of analyzing movement as a behavioral response. So you're quite right. The, dis the time frame within which decisions are made are different, but what you can actually do is m through monitoring the movement of a physician over time in that scenario, that's given you information about what's happening. The key thing is here, because you know what the brain is receiving as information, you can then understand more why they did what they did. So you're bringing that perception and the action together. So you're quite right, these time frames are different, but I think the ideas are very similar in that it's a very rich signal coming from the brain that tells you something about the thought processes and what they're trying to do. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, so in fact, not even just augmented reality, so that same idea, so when I talked about the GPS, at the minute, you only know your player's movement in isolation, really. But with RFID technology, where you can know maybe all the players and the ball, then you're getting that really rich source of information that can allow you to analyze the behaviors in those different ways. So I see that it can be extended out, the same principles can be applied in many different uh, uh, areas. One more, uh, sorry, Just one more right here. Oh, I, there's a, I have the microphone. I, I can walk the microphone over there later, but we can take this one here on, the, on your right. Hey. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Naranjan from Cats and VR. So uh, in the States, uh, I've tried to work with NFL teams and things like that, showing them the value. Uh, what pains have you had trying to, you know, push this, you know, tell people the value of this league-wide uh, to teams, to players, to coaches who are not necessarily, they're like, what are you, 
what are you pushing? This is not the way we've been doing a lot of these sports. There's legacy, the ways people have been doing Absolutely. it. Uh, what have been your pro issues and how have you overcome them when dealing with like league level and uh, team level of management? So I suppose it comes from my starting point. I'm a researcher and I've been doing this for 20 years and I had absolutely no intention of trying to start a company and take this any further. But I, through the research, you realize what the principles are. And I think because I've done a lot of the research that validates the principles that shows the richness and what the behaviors actually mean, that really helps because the data don't lie. If you can relate them back to performance and it matches what they think their best players are doing, then I think that's one of the big inroads there as well. But you're absolutely right, it can be very difficult to get that adoption. For me, it's getting the players interested and allowing the players to know that this gives new insight about their performance. So being able to identify skill deficits, to be able to identify biases, that then becomes something they can go and train and they're aware of as well. So I think it's making sure that the information you're giving them is insightful and meaningful. Cool. Was there a question? There was a the question slide? here. Here we go. Uh, good day, Russell Connell. Um, so, so the big benefit of what you're doing is that you can tr control the repeatability of the exercises yep. for a human um, experiment, which is fairly rare. So, how do you how do you then present that information back to the player of your, your decision was incorrect? You should have been looking over here versus looking over there, or Whatever, whatever the adjustment they need to make. Yeah, so we don't really do that. I'm not a great believer that it was necessarily a wrong decision. What we do is we look at what somebody does, when and how they do it. So those are the three pillars that we examine. So what we're really trying to do here is feed this into the concept of action intelligence. So through these three pillars, they'll all have different weightings. And by changing the level of difficulty of the task, which we know what makes it more or less difficult in terms of the spatial temporal constraints in which you have to act, by manipulating all of that, you can then get this high level score that means something. And the gentleman's right over there, coaches want one number yeah. and it needs to say something to them. So what the players get out of it is being able to repeat the same exercise and use that as their own feedback loop? So there's two different things. There's the profiling, where it's the same, because that allows you to benchmark and track performance over time. And I suppose something I didn't mention in terms of the rehabilitation is say players with concussion, being able to know, well, you were there, now you're here, and you can't lie in these tests, whereas you can lie in some of the other tests, and you're showing that return to performance. So you as an organization are more confident in the return to injury pro or return from injury protocol. So the other one is then training. And that's variability in practice. So we know from sports psychology how important variability in practice is. And what it allows you to do is practice things that de-risks it. it. You can do it in a psychologically safe environment. So the English cricket board who were speaking to us about the cricket, what they were saying, the batting coaches, it allows his young players to try things that they wouldn't try out on the crease. A 90 mile an hour ball coming at you in your first innings is pretty terrifying. So they want them to have experienced that, to practice calibrating their action honing the skill within that context. And that gives them that confidence when they go out onto the pitch, which is so important as well, to believe you can do it. So is that, will they be doing that kind of thing before playing on a particular game? So for... Because at the moment they'll, they'll have batting practice before yes. they play. Yes. So the English Cricket Board, their vision is that they'll be doing it in the changing room before they go out on the crease. So you're getting your eye in rather than drinking drink, drink a cup of tea as they do in England. But so you're trying to do that type of thing. So you're doing that or your players, you're giving them that additional batting practice. So they decommissioned pro batter, which was essentially a system that showed video and then it had a ball launching machine in beside, behind. So that was decoupling perception and action. And they realized that what players were just doing was still batting against a, a, a bowling machine and the visual information of the batting action had nothing to do with the resulting trajectory, which is wrong. You know, so you've decoupled the two.